and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I am filming a watercolor experiment uh, live on Twitch. This allows me to kind of uh, spend a little bit more time with the video, have people come into the live chat and ask questions and hang out, uh, etc. So it's going to be on the longer end and it's not going to be edited. So there's going to be some pauses or points where I'm going to be doing a dry off. So just be wary of that. And I'll let you know when that's going to happen. So I think everything's set up the way I want it to be. Um, in front of me, I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I'm going to saturate it with water and then I'm going to talk through my ideas for today's painting. So this Stonehenge Aqua, it is 11 by 15, 100% cotton, and 140 pound cold press. I'm saturating it with the Ron Ranson Hake brush. And my idea is built off of yesterday's experiment, where sometimes I do these fast and loose tonalist paintings where um, the experiment might be okay if I take these two colors mix them together to kind of get a neutral um, put pigment in lift pigment out and build a scene up in that fashion that, that's you know, something I like to experiment with then yesterday was the idea of doing that creating a um, monochromatic or a two colored painting doing a dry off then from there doing washes and glazes over it with um, different colors from the palette uh, then maybe doing a crisp layer of pigment after another dry off um, etc kind of just doing overall glazes of one tone I think I took burnt sienna and I apologize if I mix up um, the academic language um, so I took you know one color like burnt sienna did an overall wash and then at a later point I took cerulean and ultramarine in different spots lemon yellow and washed them in to kind of play around one of the first things that I saw with the experiment uh, since it was kind of rushed was that my initial um, monochromatic two-tone was very light it dried light and I used a two-tone that usually dries dark but I literally only spent five minutes on that one portion so and it was wet and wet so I don't think I allowed myself to get that pigment to really build up uh, the second thing was that and I don't know if I mentioned I used thalo green and um, quinacridone rose the thalo green kind of showed through at the end and that was totally fine. However, I feel like thalo green isn't quite uh, antique looking. So I was kind of a little bit turned off by that color showing through at the end. Uh, those are two things, the first two criticisms I had of the experiment that I did yesterday. And as I go from part to part, I'll talk about it. But like I said, this will probably be a longer video, and um, and I apologize for that. I know people prefer shorter videos, but I wanted to, um, after my initial experiment, now kind of push it to the limit. I'll probably use sap green and Venetian red. That's what I had just put out on the palette. Uh, those two colors I like to use for kind of a monochromatic two-colored painting because of um, Stuart Davies and um, Dennis Sheehan who do that in oil painting. They'll mix those two colors and uh, make these beautiful uh, oil paintings from additive and subtractive methods. With watercolor the technique does work However, I do get um, a, a tonal, a drying 
lightning effect that happens when this dries with these two colors. So I will often add in uh, burnt umber or thalo blue or ultramarine to kind of help that dark tones stay. And alternatively, I could use uh, burnt umber. Essentially, my, my thought is approaching watercolor from the aspect of um, an oil painting underpainting, where it's monochromatic two tone, putting in the tones and then glazing over it. That's what I want to try with watercolor. So, I need to make up a landscape. I don't have anything quite planned. Uh, these two colors alone give a very cool antique feel. They'll um, mix together for a brown. You'll have aspects of your green. And you'll have aspects of that red. So we'll just start putting it in. We'll treat this as if it's going to be a complete toneless painting. And then we'll do a dry off. We may even push it further and then do glazes on top of that. So that's the plan. I think I probably repeated it a few times and I apologize, but it's just to get my mind in the right mindset. I'm scrubbing into the sky. I'm going to wipe back for uh, kind of different textures and tones. And the cool thing about this technique is that you could really have fun with it. You just go right back and forth. And um, it really works well for fast and loose painting. And if you find yourself um, you find that you don't want to stop doing it. It's, it's very weird. Even though um, you can very quickly get a very aesthetically pleasing, satisfactory finish, you may hit a point where you're just like, oh man, I just want to keep doing it. It's so much fun. And you're not really overworking in the painting. It's just, it's, yeah, it's enjoyable. And working wet and wet, and working with that paper towel, I am pulling that water up, but I could easily come back in with that hake brush and add that water back in. Anyway, let's try to get uh, some interesting semblance of a landscape. Using the hake to I'll try to use the hake for most of it so that there's not too much back and forth, but I'll probably use the rigger for some stuff at some points. It's not necessary right now. And um, I'll even use the magic eraser, which when it's time to use the magic eraser, I'll, um, I'll talk about its properties. So I really like just kind of putting in forms and softening them back to where I want them to be. Today was nice. Um, we went antiquing, you know, and thrifting, which is something that I really enjoy doing. And um, we haven't been able to go out and about because of COVID and us actually having COVID. Um, so we were able to do that. I found a bunch of picture frames at one place for about 25 cents each. I think it was six for a dollar or something like that. Um, 
So I picked up eight frames and I'll be able to fit oil paintings in them or um, watercolor. I think some of them have glass, which is just absolutely awesome because you all know how expensive frames are. That's one thing. If I um, sell a painting, I always offer to frame it if I can, you know, and if I have a frame on hand. I just can't. It's just crazy how expensive um, getting something matted and framed is. It, it, I think people pay more to get one of my works matted and framed than to um, than they pay for the work itself. I, I really don't charge that much for my paintings. My name isn't big enough yet. <laughs> This is how we'll start putting this scene together. So like I said, this is more of just a hangout video. Um, you're more than welcome, if this is on YouTube, to just skip ahead, skip back and forth and all that. Because I'm just going to hang out and blab. And then whenever I get to certain ports that I find are important to discuss, I'll discuss it in that time. So it's not going to be rushed. It'll probably be an hour long video. And no fancy editing taking place. I just don't have the time for that. I think if this was my full time job, I would have to do that. But I just, uh, you know, this is my kind of side hobby. Anyway, so we went antiquing. I found a, um, a longboard, you know, a, a skateboard at one place for like 30 bucks. And um, it has it had these wheels on it that were kind of popular, controversial wheels because the design of them. They um, have these weird waves, they're called shark wheels. So I picked it up because it was worth it for the wheels alone just to try them out. So we got some frames, we got that. One place that I go to, I look for um, vintage art equipment or painting equipment or uh, fountain pens. And the one guy had a book on fountain pens collecting, which I don't own any books on collecting fountain pens, even though I have like a collection of them. And he had held on to it for me from before I had gotten COVID. So I picked that up from him. I think sometimes it's just nice to build, you know, fun relationships like that with um, shop owners. And, um, it's always cool being recognized by, well, I have a huge beard, so it's very easy to recognize me, but um, it's always nice being recognized by uh, shop owners and them being friendly. I'm going to grab a little bit of Payne's Gray. I kind of want to start darkening this up a little bit. Now, the Payne's Gray is going to dry a little bit lighter. And I'm trying to keep this as kind of antiqued and monochromatic as possible. I have a um, Kindle right over here that whenever I live stream, I can view the live stream with a few second delay. And it also lets me see the live chat. And you can see it's kind of, um, coming through as you know brownish green at this point we're getting a little bit of darker values for it so we're still staying with kind of the initial idea of building up textures and tones and 
hopefully you'll see that this um, method alone is just viable for producing a finished work of art. And it's gonna, uh, not gonna lie, it's gonna hurt a little bit whenever I'm at the stage with the experimentation with the glazing. If it's a nice painting, well, who knows, maybe it'll become a terrible painting. So far, staying away from the any other art tool with this one. Who's playing around back there? Percy, come on. Should have a little more shadow in here. This would be fun working, um, as I had said, using burnt um, umber that produces fantastic results by itself. Even just a student brand paint like um, cotton and produces amazing results for monochromatic with this kind of back and forth technique. Um, let's make some paints gray. So I'm using the paper towel kind of as like a sponge, soaking up excessive water, giving textures. And if you start getting a lot of pigment on it, you could start sponging it down as well. Paint's gray. It's all about texture and tonality right now. dark undersides of this foliage. A part of me is tempted to film it as two separate videos. Let me know in the comments what do you think would be a better overall. Um, for them to have been two separate videos, one where it's kind of a tutorial on how to paint in this fashion. But I have a lot of those up on YouTube. And then um, having the second video of the glazes. I have been enjoying the whole YouTube process and you know, people have been starting to comment more or ask questions more. And um, I really, really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Now what I'm gonna do, 
I'm going to introduce the rigger here. Reason being is that I know we're going to have that tonal shift that I talked about. Wait, hold on. It sounds like Percy's chewing on something. Percy, you're chewing on something. Percy, you can't chew on that. Come on, Percy. <sighs> Cats in an art room. I just want to get a lot of this feeling completed before we even start going to that whole glazing and then putting more layers on top. As you can probably see, there's areas that are damp and then areas that are going to uh, darken. In areas that are light already. This is a number four rigger. I've been talking about the, the rigger brushes a lot lately and how I've been um, wanting to maybe experiment with a one smaller than a one. This is a number four silver black velvet. But experiment with different ones for super fine. Twigs. But we'll see how that goes. One thing that I would love would be for um, a brush company to be like, hey, we're going to send you a brush to try out. That'd be really cool. If anybody out there knows a great way to go about doing something like that, let me know. Okay. So, let's take a moment. Add a little bit of texture to some spots. Um... Like I said, you can probably see some areas that are damp, some areas that are not. When we do the dry off, we're going to get an overall lighting lighting effect. It's going to lighten up. Um, so usually I would can continue working with these, darkening it, or do a second layer of paint. So let's use the blow dryer, and we'll see what happens. So if you have earbuds on, watch your ears, and here it comes. So that's the first dry off. Um, just to reiterate, as you can see, we had some stuff lighten up. I'm thinking that one of two approaches, or we, we could choose the other one. I can continue 
now layering over this and I would get kind of a starker contrast or I can do a glaze over this meaning taking a watery mix with a brush and applying it over it um, and letting the whole painting tint in that direction um, and then from there do our second layer of painting Maybe play around a little bit wet and wet if I needed to kind of accentuate some stuff. But then do a dry off and then do the next layer of the painting. And maybe even glaze on top of that and just kind of go back and forth. So what I'm going to do is do the glaze. I'm going to take the large hake, excuse me, just because it's going to be easier for me to um, apply an overall wash. And why don't we get, oh, it's so hard to uh, do something like this. Let's get a little weird with it. Let's get um, a laser and crimson and let's see how that does. I'm catching a little bit of this water from the Payne's Gray and these guys on the side. Knock that out. Oh, man. I get a good amount. Lizard and Crimson does have a tendency to kind of not show through that much for me. Um, I think I just don't use it that much. All right, I think we should have a good enough soupy mix and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this over the whole thing. Um, it's the moment of truth. And let's see how everything changes. The flat hake brush is really nice because um, it'll help me get that f nice smooth covering. You can see obviously how it shows through on the um, the white sky. Grab a little bit more. Now, one of the things that does affect this is that we have water that we apply. And with water, you want to think about it as um, cement or blacktop when you're outside. It looks darker whenever it's wet. So that's what's kind of taking place here a little bit. Um, that the water is also causing an effect. And then I'm also going to use another tool, which I want to talk about. The tool works good in this stage from the experiments because we already have the water there. I'm going to take piece of magic eraser and I'm going to scrub out a little bit of sunlight or light back in there. So we'll see how it works with this. Uh, let me cut off a clean piece. Magic eraser is a material called melanin foam and melanin foam is um, sold very cheaply in bulk on Amazon or at the dollar store. So you don't have to go out and buy the dollar, um, the Magic Eraser brand. I need just some more water on it. Now what's happening, it's an abrasive. It's not a chemical action. So it's not doing any um, chemical type harm. However, it is doing harm to the paper itself in the sense of rubbing at it. So one thing to keep in mind is that you're essentially, I guess, sanding it down. I, I believe Magic Eraser or Melanin Foam says not to use it on uh, cookware or eatingware. And that's one of the reasons why, because it's 
an abrasive, and I think it's leaving that abrasive there. A little bit of highlights in these areas. So it's just wet, and if I need to, I just take the paper towel and come in and lift up some spots. Okay, so we had that. Now, that so far, we did that. I could take another wash. In fact, why don't we grab some water and now grab ultramarine blue. And we'll see how a wash over the wash works. And that kind of will get us a little bit of a grady, uh, gradation coming down in the sky, essentially. It's going to mix to that purplish effect. But I don't want just a hard edge where it comes back. I'm not adept at this. We'll see. We'll even let that come down here. And bring it up a little bit. Okay. So, so far, what we did was we used the flat hake brush to um, apply a lizard and crimson over the whole thing. And then we use the melanin foam, the magic eraser to erase back to some whites, which we can use at any point. The 100% cotton paper um, really holds up well for me for this type of experimentation. But you'll know that painting over those spots does start to um, act differently. So it's kind of like scraping with a card into it. It kind of damages the paper some, or using a razor blade in a spot, it does damage the paper some. So just be prepared for that. So, anywho, what I'm thinking of now is how I kind of just wanted to really accentuate some shadows down here because I'm gonna do another layer of trees after I do a dry off, but I always like to do my shadows wet and wet in the water or the reflections. Just put that there and there for right now. Okay, so being that this is live, this is gonna be another dry off, so I apologize. So if you have earbuds on, watch your ears. It should take about 10 seconds. So that should be dry enough. Um, now this does look lighter in tone than when we had started doing those uh, glazes. So a part of me wonders if, how much pigment we're moving around from that original amount. Anyway, I'm going to take the number four rigger. Um, and I'm going to start mixing some darks. And I'm going to start doing a kind of closer application, a crisper level of painting. So this effect 
kind of gives the illusion of kind of a haze all around and then we're going to have stuff coming closer and then we'll try glazing over that so number four rigger uh, silver black velvet holds a great quantity of pigment um, it's a mixture of Venetian red and what else did I say? Um, Payne's gray. So just mixing a dark. I think I'm gonna do a whole layer of trees here. And I'm going to use the hake to texturize this light layer. We're going to get our dark shadows and reflections. What's up, Percy? I have to trim Percy's nails. Um, she's so sweet. She makes uh, biscuits all the time. And sometimes she likes to make biscuits in my beard. Um, but if her nail gets through to my chin, that's not always the best. I don't say anything to, to her though. Because she's my little Percy Poo, right Percy? Let's uh, get a little bit of foliage. We got a lot of water on the brush right now. Just gonna kind of roll with it. We've got some texture going here. We'll just take the card. Percy, be careful. I'm gonna do some trees in the spots that I'm marking out. some burnt umber. I'm going to do the same thing with the hake. gray just to start darkening that corner as I enjoy doing some foliage coming off the side okay you can also play around with the number one rigger here But I want to start making my way to a dry off so that 
we can then play around with more washes on top and see what happens. Getting grass, twigs, and branches, and just textures. So, being that we're live, there's going to be another dry off, and I apologize for that. Um, got some textures happening here first. And let's see what happens. All right, here's the next dry off. So when I was doing the experiment yesterday, after trying a hake brush overall um, glazing, I then switched to a kind of mop brush in order to play around in different areas and allow kind of localized glazes to take place. So that was the next experiment, i.e. maybe applying a greenish glaze here maybe a, um, a blue in some areas, just kind of just experimenting and seeing what those localized ones would happen and what would work with it. So the brush that I'm going to use for that is a super awesome brush that I haven't used in years. This was from when I was doing the Chinese painting. I got it from Blue Heron Arts. It's, um, it's called the Giant Cloud Brush. I believe it's, um, uh, it's a goat hair, it's a, or it's a soft hair, and it'll kind of let me kind of work with the edges and play around, as opposed to just when I was going with flat back and forth. You could use a mop brush, I'm sure, with this, or anything like that, or maybe even small riggers or small round brushes, but this is just me wanting to play with this brush, because I rarely ever get the chance, and you know, I'd spent quite some money on it. So let's grab a little lemon yellow. And now this is just playing around and seeing what happens, putting washes in, in different areas. And my idea, and that's kind of a heavy load of lemon yellow, but I think it'll work for us here. 
my idea was to use this mop and to kind of eventually get an overall uniform wetness to the paper, more or less. But this will kind of help play with edges of hard and soft. This is probably thicker than I should be going, but you know, this is just experimentation. Why don't I mix this with some ultramarine blue? Start pushing towards a green. Mop in some green. I feel like I'm dabbing more than passing it in. And once again, recall, remember from earlier, that we want to be wary of the fact that we're adding water not only because it's going to push things around underneath it, but it's also going to give the illusion of that area being darker because of the water. Let's grab some uh, burnt sienna. And wash that in the foreground. Maybe a glaze of the burnt sienna will help the foreground come even closer, even that it's such a warm color. Does the glaze have to be uniform or can I kind of rinse off the brush, get fresh water, and spread that around? Can I feed Payne's Gray into it? These are all questions that you want to ask yourself when you experiment. Let's take burnt umber. Washing some burnt umber over these sides. Some raw sienna. And burnt umber and ultramarine. Let that come over into a burnt umber. Ooh, it looks like we got some of that Venetian red on there. That Venetian red is so strong, it's a um, kind of an opaque color, so I have to be careful with that. Let's bring some dry brushes across. Just for the insanity, not the insanity of it, just the craziest of it. Let's grab a little bit of um, cerulean blue. Wash that over these parts. And then we can take our magic eraser, wet the end of it, clean up areas that we want to play around with, meaning to cut off another piece. So all I do is just take a razor with it. If you're a young adult, child, anything like that, doing that, get your parent to do that for you. Don't hurt yourself. We can even use these wash times to put in some other effects. In fact, I can take the number one rigger and usually in the background when I'm doing wet and wet, I'll feed in uh, branches and trees and trunks which will soften up but I could probably even feed in at this stage to get different effects to happen here that'll soften up so play around with it like just have fun okay so at this point I'm gonna do a dry off 
remember we applied water so um, we are going to have a lighting taking place so totally it's going to lighten up again it's just something that this is the story of my life with watercolor so I'm going to do a dry off and then I think I'm going to do one last uh, painting in and I think in this case I'm going to get some really dark stuff going in the foreground that lemon yellow really mellowed out quite a bit didn't it Okay, so here's the dry off. Those dry off moments are always great times to uh, clean up your work area or um, to mix on your palette. I'm gonna go for my super dark. This has been ultramarine and uh, burnt sienna, uh, burnt umber lately, is what I've been using for my super dark. I'll even let Payne's Gray work its way into that. And this is going to be what I was imagining was a bigger tree coming here and I'm using the heel of the brush I'm using just the different attributes of it to get that squirmy squiggly feel to it And if you get light handed with it enough, you can get some pretty thin lines coming off. And you do want to sit it in place or I want a lot of texture there. So I'm going to kind of do dry brush scrubbing on the side. I wanted two trees is what I imagined coming up from here or maybe I'll do a line of three or four just kind of coming up Extra going around them. We didn't even play with any splattering on this, which might help this layer. I wonder. The reason I say that is because I inadvertently splattered. We may do one last glazing over this in certain areas, just kind of darken some spots. I think it's fun. I think it adds a good um, atmospheric effect to these paintings. Um,
So in the live chat, we got Nalus of Tarth. Hey, how's it going, man? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm kind of playing around with like getting uh, super moodier. Where I started with a moody monochromatic painting, and then I started glazing colors over it, wet and wet, and then um, building that next layer, and then coming closer, and then closer, and working in that fashion. And yeah, this is to get like that kind of moody, um, antique feel to the painting. I think we could even benefit from another. So I, I want to make sure I don't overlap that this guy right in the background, but pick a secondary tree right up in here be fun I don't think I'm gonna give these guys any foliage and if I do it'll be very light grass growing around it um, you're drawing your first forest scene in a while along with you cheers How's Twitch been going for you? Been a while since I popped in. Oh, okay, cool. So I'm glad to hear you're drawing a far scene. Um, the far scenes drawing, it's like weird, the mindset you have to get in. Um, because of kind of like with the painting, I work back to forward. I wonder if you have to work forward to back with drawing. I'm curious what approach you're taking with that. Um, Twitch has been going pretty good. I use the Twitch for videos that I think are going to be longer or um, if I'm doing a commission piece so that it's a nice personal video that I have uploaded to YouTube for somebody. Um, otherwise, if it's something that's going to take me tutorial wise, if, if I'm going to do, let's say 30 minutes or less, I'll film it directly onto my phone. After 30 minutes, my phone does something different. Oh, you don't have a tried and true method yet. Well, that's cool. So you're in that fun, like experimentation phase. Um, and you work, you said from people usually, are you working from a photograph or are you, uh, making up the scenes for your landscape drawings? And if you don't mind me making any suggestions, um, one thing that helps that helped me is if I was gonna sketch, I look at um, landscape painters from the 1800s. And um, I'll look at the, the landscape painters from the 1800s and I'll uh, sketch their work and I'll practice off of that. Uh, another great way for me when I, was, when I do landscape practice, I'll take, um, What's his name? Um, Ansel Adams, that photographer, the American photographer who photographed like all over landscapes, sketching his work. It was really good practice for me, but I'm still a novice for uh, sketching landscapes. Yeah. So it's a 14 day challenge. So what are you trying to do? Like a drawing every day? Yeah, Ansel Adams is really good. I was uh, sketching from his um, Yosemite series. And his just tonal contrast is just absolutely fantastic. Where you have the super dark, super light, you have just everything. He, he was so good. I think it would be nice to get a little bit of... Um, texture up in the sky for trees I don't know if I want to splatter or if I want to hake also um I've been following this Facebook page 
uh, monochromy, uh, past and present, I think it's called. And there's a lot of like antique photos that get shared on there. And either it's just like, okay, that's really cool. That's just an antique photo from the 1880s. And it's cool to see how things looked. Or some of the stuff is um, not only somebody who was a photographer, but it was them turning it into an art medium. And some of the artwork and the photography is just fantastic. And it's like, oh, okay, this is great to sketch or to learn from. I think the uh, prompt was journey. So I'm thinking two roads diverging in the woods from Robert Frost. One is artistic and uphill and one is incorporate and level easy path. Okay, that's cool. That's a cool idea. I've never, um, I don't know if I've ever painted from a prompt or did any artwork from a prompt. I, think, I know a lot of people do it when they get stuck in a rut or if they're looking for a new medium or, um, I don't mean that in a negative context of like stuck in a rut, but I have a hard time with prompts because they're probably too vague for me. I like don't know what to do. Yeah, there's so much good reference. You're right. There's a lot of good reference material out there. And um, you would think like on uh, Instagram, Instagram has this one group it's like it starts with a c something art and it's uh photography um of nude men and women for artists to use for painting purposes which is um uh, you know, really cool i want to kind of really darken up these areas You feel like you're in a rut. Yeah, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. I have um too many ideas going on at the moment. And um too many requests because my Patreon page is uh, starting to take off and um someone had asked if I could do like city scene type stuff. So I'm going to have to work on that been working on incorporating gestural movements and Chinese motifs like uh, Siamese fish and stuff like that which is a lot of fun and then there's these experiments with the landscape there's just so much so much to do it's a little time I'm just helping to wash this over Yeah, they don't like nudity much on Instagram. Um, I think they might like cover the um, the private parts or have them standing in such a way where they're not showing. But um, it's like purely artistic. It's not like erotic uh, type stuff. So I don't know if they made an exception for that group or what, or if, like I said, maybe they're doing some sort of coverage on it. So I darken up that. One of these uh, lights is causing a gl uh, glare right here. Probably this light right here. Yeah. And then, I'm sure I've mentioned this, but I coach uh, powerlifting and next weekend we are hosting regionals. And then two or three weeks from that is gonna be state. And then we're running, uh, so we're doing high school, or we do high school. But in April, we're actually running and hosting uh, collegiate nationals, which is gonna be a lot of work. And we do all that to put money back into um, 
you know, the high school powerlifting program where I, where I teach and coach. So that's going to start um, pulling away from painting time as well. I wonder if I could get one more dark tree right in here. Or if that would overdo it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds fun, but it's really exhausting. And what if we travel for, um, because we'll, we'll travel for state. I just can't sleep well in a hotel room. And we could be um, coaching all day or they can be competing all day. It's just really hard. And then the one coach that I usually share a room with, he uh, he obviously has sleep apnea. <laughs> and if he falls asleep before me, it's uh, it's hard for me to fall asleep because of his snoring. In fact, <laughs> we had um, we were at state or somewhere, or it might have been um, bringing them back from nationals. Oh dang, 38, 40 hours a week. Just take a look. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Long work weeks are takes a lot out of you. I'm gonna uh kind of accentuate some stuff with uh raw sienna. Um we were we we're coming back from we're going to we we're out of meat. Anyway, so me and the guy that I usually bunk with, he he turns on the TV. And the, uh, there was a movie on TV, on cable. It was a uh, Pretty Woman or whatever. And he's like, oh, this is a great movie. And I'm like, oh, I never, uh, I, I never seen it. I never, I don't know. He's like, oh, it's great. And then he just starts snoring. And I'm like, well, okay, I guess he passed out. And then he wakes up and he's like, oh, this is a great scene. <laughs> he's like, this is where they're really mean to her. And she shows that she has money or something. And then he falls right back asleep. <laughs> and just snoring. And then he makes, wakes up, makes another comment about the movie. And I'm like, all right. Falls back asleep. So I turn off the movie. And a few minutes later, he's like, oh, what happened to the TV? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I do. You're in and out of sleep, man. I'm dotting some... Uh, Raw sienna here, just to kind of give a little accents, add a little bit of interest. Sure, I wonder how it shows up. Yeah, he knows exactly when to sleep. And then it's funny. Um, we have a really successful program, and um, we have a few coaches, like quite a few coaches, and having you know coaches and dedicated people really does help make a program successful. And if he bunks with one of the other guys, it's a Robin Daryl. Daryl snores even more than Rob. And uh, one time they bunked together and Rob was like, dude, Daryl fell asleep and I just could not go to sleep. So he kind of got a taste of his own medicine. So, you know, don't even know how uh, things are going to turn out. Like, we have regionals this coming weekend, so we're going to host that, and we're going to have our kids lift in it. And then, you know, then the next step is state. But we've been having just a crazy amount of COVID quarantines, um, where if the way they do it is if somebody tests positive, then they do contact tracing and anybody around them within, I think, 48 hours uh, for a certain amount of time or something like that gets quarantined. So they quarantined the whole powerlifting team at one point, which was the right thing to do because, you know, it really, it, it spreads like crazy. And then during that quarantine, I wound up getting it. So I had I was exposed and I had gotten it. And I'm on that tail end of um, 
the breathing issues and it's been a little over three weeks now but hopefully none of our kids or coaches get exposed within the next week before regionals or before state or anything like that but and if somebody does get exposed don't worry i'll make sure that they get quarantined and that they don't try to um pass things off i don't know if i want to put that lemon yellow there i'm looking at it in the um the small video i think that might these little drops might add a little bit of interest to the foreground A lot of experimentation taking place. Kind of pulling out of that pigment and mellowing it out a little bit. Yeah, one of these times I need to paint a Bigfoot. I actually did something like that once. Um, in Louisiana, they have a swamp monster called a Rougarou. And um, I put a little Rougarou somewhere in the background. Um, I'm not sure the origin of the myth, but it, you know, it comes from you know just the Cajun culture. And it's you know obviously like, a, I guess, a French word. They have the, the Rougarous. Uh, cryptids. Cryptids are the, like cryptozoology, like the study of animals and that they're not sure if it exists, right? That's what cryptids are. I would like to be able to have the talent to paint like um, like a wood nymph type thing right there, but I, I'm not I'm nowhere near that to be able to do something like that. But I think something like that would be absolutely beautiful. Yeah, the modern weird, weird creatures like yeah, Mothman, Rougarou, yeah, cryptids. But yeah, like I guess like a. Uh, a wood nymph would be like a, um, a cryptid or something. And that would look really cool right there. I have no idea how I'd go about doing something like that. I would have to... First of all, I'd have to look at a lot of paintings from... Like the 1850s, early 1900s. When they did a lot of um, the illustrative stuff. I'm sure there's a lot that take place there. I'm not going to add it into the, the painting itself, but I would think that you could take like a raw sienna, a Venetian red for a flesh tone. You know, that's a little too bloody. See, I'm just, uh, with my paintings, they're just gestural. I don't have the talent. And I'm, I'm not saying it's like downplay or whatever. 
like a um, there's a woman standing with her hand on her hip wonder if the wood nymph would stand something like that <laughs> like what you want she looks <laughs> she looks pissed <laughs> Yeah, what if I um if I grab a little bit of gouache? Where's my spray bottle? I'll just grab some, some fresh gouache. The reason I'm grabbing the gouache is um, to help it stand out against the paint that's already there. And that's the cool thing about like the Twitch. I know you asked how Twitch was going earlier. I wouldn't be trying this or even thinking of this. If it wasn't for, you know, you suggesting something like that, you know? Well, Sienna. And gouache. That alone gives an interesting flesh tone for somebody that would be in the woods, uh, living in the woods or something like that. Um, if she was hunched over... Water and maybe looking at her own reflection, crouching down, looking at a reflection in the water. I could do something like that. Maybe I could do one standing. And one crouching down looking at the reflection. Kind of like. Yeah, let's try that out. Okay, so this is gouache and raw sienna. The head. The shoulders. Your back's going to arch. You're going to come to your butt. And you're going to come up with the thighs and the feet are going to come down as so you're hunched over looking at the water arms coming out how's that looking in the camera uh, saving for a camera, I want to stream art on Twitch. Well, first of all, don't feel like your art is stale um, or not. I mean, anything you do is going to add to like, and I, I don't mean to sound pompous, but I think the term is zeitgeist, which is kind of like what, you know, is being produced currently in the world. And, um, I'm using just my cell phone. I just have a um, Samsung SG8. And I just have that up on a tripod right here. And that tripod has just a little $8 adapter to hold the phone and it films straight down. I added the Kindle just so I could kind of see what's going on uh, in the chat. But like in all seriousness, um, film, I mean, even if nobody's watching, like you're the only person that came in today and started hanging out and talking and all that. Um, and sometimes I'm on here and, and nobody comes in, but that's, you know, it's totally fine and it's fun. And I think, 
I encourage you to, to do it. If you have a camera, a phone, or anything, start filming. And we'll call the painting something like wood nips or something. Um, you keep drawing pretty Pinterest girls, and that's just not an interest to me anymore. Oh, so this is from your phone. Yeah, yeah. This is just the SG. Um, just pointing down and filming. Black wash for hair. Oh, black was a good choice for that hair. Let me move this out the way. Need a little accents. But yeah, I mean, drawing from Pinterest uh, of photographs, and then there's nothing like that's what I need to do, that's what I need to learn how to do. Um, I wonder if I should have done yellow for the hair. Could make her a warrior. Give her a long. Well, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to sign this painting. Um, I'm going to put a mat over it so we can see what it looks like. And then um, after that, I'm going to log off. So I appreciate you hanging out and um, chatting with me during this. And I hope to see you again soon. And... I encourage you to definitely start filming your own stuff just so you even get in the practice of filming stuff even if you feel like it's stagnant at least you'll be getting the practice of, of doing that portion um, let's see you think the lit nymphs came out pretty cool thank you even with a little <laughs> sword I appreciate that um, let me tilt the angle on this a little bit so we can see the whole thing and I'm gonna sign I don't know if I want to sign him white 
What do you think? Should I sign him white in the gel pen or sign him black? Um, while we're thinking about how to sign it, for those of you watching this at a later date on YouTube, please uh, consider liking and subscribing. Um, and I have a whole bunch of links down below if you want to support the channel and all that. Okay, so the decision is to sign in white, and that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign right down here. With the 11 by 14, there's not too much uh, wiggle room. So I put the mat over it to sign it. There you go. So I hope you all enjoyed. And um, oddly enough, I'm going to go watch uh, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, what's my Instagram? I don't have it below. My Instagram is Andrew Broussard Watercolors. So pretty much everything besides Twitch is Andrew Broussard or Andrew Broussard Watercolors for me. Yeah, the white was a good choice with that, with the signature. So, um, yeah, shoot me a, a follow or whatever on Instagram. And then, you know, just comment or something saying that it's uh, Malice from um, Twitch. And if I don't remember any names, I apologize. But um, I hope to talk to you all soon. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lord of the Rings is a good choice, too. Yeah, so. <laughs> and the white. Thank you. All right. Y'all take care. Have a good night. You'll be safe, all right? And thanks for hanging out. Bye.